Today, we're talking about the sixth century. So we're moving in a hundred year span. Does that make sense? We started with Zana, it became a Christian nation. The next hundred years, we have the nine saints coming in, the expansion of monasteries. And then the next hundred years, we're gonna be dealing with a king named Caleb. This is perhaps one of the most documented events in history throughout the world. It's one of the most moving stories, and yet Ethiopians know very little about it. Now, without reading all this stuff, uh, who knows the story of Khaled? Don't, don't do that. Uh, who, who, he's like raising his hand. Uh, who knows the story of Khaled? So that shows us how much we don't know our own history. Now, there's a reason for that, and I, trust me, I'll get into that. But this is one of the most written about history, and historians, and I love this story, because historians are forced to accept it. Other things in our, in our history books, they can't accept it, they don't wanna accept it, they throw it away, they think everything is fake, but this story, they're forced to accept it, and we'll see why in just a second. The story is about how the Ethiopian king Caleb went to rescue the Christians suffering in a region named Hamar. Now, remember, we're talking about the 6th century. This is essentially 100 years before the rise of uh, Islam. Now, Islam, as you guys know, had its presence in the Middle East. Himar is in the present-day Yemen, the Middle East. So this is before uh, Islam, right before the, the beginning of uh, Islam. But at, because it's before Islam, the competition was among Christians and Jews. That was a competition. So in that region, if the Christians were in power, the Jews would be sidelined. And if the Jews were in power, the Christians would be persecuted. At that time, that's what happened. Now, in 518 AD, the Jews were in power, meaning the Christians were being persecuted. Where? In present-day Yemen, right? So the Ethiopian king Caleb recognizes that people are being persecuted, not in Ethiopia, but in the Middle East. And he says, that's not right. We're fellow Christians, and I have a responsibility to go and rescue these Christians who are suffering. This is very important for our history and our understanding of how, what the Ethiopian Orthodox Auto Church is. I don't know if you're keeping up with present day politics, but the Ethiopian Orthodox Soharo Church has been branded as a religion for the ethnic group of Amhara. Uh, I don't know if I talked about this last week, but we have one of the major Protestant preachers named Yonatan publicly going and saying that Shib Shaba is an Amhara tradition. Did we talk about this? publicly going and saying this orthodox tradition, the things that we do, is meant for the Amhara people. I don't care if you're Amhara, Tigray, Orum, I don't care what you are. But these rhetorics are number one, they're not true. And number two, they're dangerous, especially in the current conflict. It is imperative for us to change the talks that are happening. If you look in the, and we've talked about this before, the concept of Amhara, the concept of Tigray, the concept of Oromo simply did not exist prior to the 11th century. It didn't exist. And we will see when it existed. Trust me, I'll get into that. Hint, hint, it has to do with Egypt. And we will see that very clearly. If there anything went wrong, blame <laughs> Egypt. So, <laughs> don't let Nabi you hear. So, at that time, the concept, if you ask them, like, what's your ethnic background? They're, we're Aksumites. They, they're not going to say, we're Tigrayan, we're Amhara, we're Oromo. We're, well, like, they're not going to say that. They're, we're Aksumites. But more importantly, we are the land of the free. Before Ethiopia, they even used the name Bihera Aga Azi. 
We are not colonized. We are free people. But we are also Christians here in the 6th century. You see people, Ethiopians, going to aid the Himorites, not because of their ethnic background, not because of what country they're from, simply because they're Christian. Simply because they're Christian. And sure enough, when Caleb heard, he said, these are my Christian brothers and sisters. He travels to the Middle East. He gets rid of the people who are persecuting the Christians. He sets up camp. He sets up uh, churches, builds churches for the local community. And he allocates Ethiopian soldiers to protect the local Hemorite Christians. I was like, what's going on? I thought the politicians were calling. He <laughs> set this down. <laughs> set this down right now. So, but then he does something that I find fascinating. Now, we've talked about this. Every time you study history, you can't study it in present day knowledge and understand. You gotta go back to that time, understand the culture, the philosophy, in order to appreciate certain things. This is in the sixth century. And in the sixth century, when you did something awesome, you don't post it on social media, hashtag awesomeness. But, but what you do is you erect these huge monuments. And then you let the world know, this is what we did. We came here through the help of God. We were able to save these people, the Himorite people, simply because they're Christians. And they erect these monuments. This is very like, common to do in that region. Why this particular monument that Caleb erected was historical, in my opinion, is because he used the non uh, consonantal form of the language of Ge'ez, even though the vowel system was already created. Let me explain what I mean by that. This monument that he built is known to be RIE 191. And I don't know if we talked about this in this place or somewhere else, but back in the fourth century, before the fourth century, the way that you write consonants and, and the Ge'ez language it didn't incorporate the vowel system. For example, my name is Da Wee Te. If you can't write Amharic, I apologize. But, but it's Da Wee Te. Before that time, the only way that you could write was using the consonants without any vowel system. So we have Da Du Di Da De De Do, right? But back then you just had Ha Le Ha Me Sa Ra, and that was it. So in order to write da, we, te, you would only have da, wa, ta. That was it. As the reader, it was up to you to say, how do you pronounce this word? I know that's not like a crazy concept, like wow, 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 but you understand that's how Arabic works today. That's how Hebrew works today. They have something called dialect, dialectics, I believe that incorporates how to read the vowel system in addition to the consonants, but it's not attached to the letters themselves. Now, when Ethiopians were doing business with, I believe, India, they came across a group of people who figured out a way to attach the vowel to the consonants. So in English, you have B as a consonant, and then you have the vowel A, and you have Ba. But the vowel is not attached to the consonants. It's a different system. But these group of Indians, they, they figured out how to attach the vowel system to the, to, to the consonants. So they said, hmm, the Ethiopians were like, I wonder if we could do the same thing. Let's take one consonant. What would happen if we add a protrusion next to it on the right side? It would give you the vowel oo. So you have a consonant, duh. And you add a protrusion next to it, same letter, the do. See how it works? Like, and then it's like, just follow the system. Hu, lu, ku, mu, su. Right? Just add a protrusion. Aha, this, is, this is great. So without changing anything, just add a little bit, slightly change stuff, and you could do it. Think about the fourth order ah sound. 
how do you do it? If it has a leg, two legs, just extend one of them. You have ah, da. Think about ba, extend one, ba, le, extend one, la. And they were like, this is awesome. So this has happened in the fourth century, 200 years prior to Khalid. Does that make sense? Ooh, okay, this is not the point I'm trying to make. So <laughs> 200 years later, we have Khalid, who has been using this system for 200 years. Now he goes into Himar, and he saves the people, and he erects this monument, and he starts to write, but he uses the old system that was used by his ancestors. He doesn't use this new system of writing, he uses the old system. Because the Caleb, he wanted to stay connected with his ancestors. He wanted to pay like respect. Yeah, we have like technology. To them, this like new writing system was technology, right? It was advancement. But you know, there's no reason to throw away the old. There, there are times like you have to stop and remember who you are. It's your identity. And this is an important thing. Like, especially when we come to America, we desperately try to get rid of who we are, our identity. Who, this is a problem. That's a problem. And it begins with the small things, including our name. This is a true story. I remember in high school, uh, once I went to hang out with my church friends who are from Maryland. I grew up in Virginia. Like, it's Virginia, if you guys, it's Virginia, you know? My friends, they grew up in like Maryland, but the ghetto side. There was a lot of yo-yo involved, you know what I'm saying? Like, we just hung around the wrong, like the very different crowd, you know what I'm saying? Like, we just, we just walked different, acted different, and I didn't know this. And this is, you know, we're in high school, so we're around 16, 17, you care about your environment, all that. I never knew this. So one day I went to Maryland to hang out with them. We were taking a bus. I don't usually take buses on my own, you know? I don't know the protocol, but there are people around, and my friend was like around there. I wanted to get his attention. And I say, Kirwin, Kirwin, Kirwin. And then he saw me and walked away. I figured like he didn't hear me. So I'm like, Kirwin, Kirwin. And then when I walked in, like, what are you doing? Because you know, it's Kerbo. You know what I'm saying? That's not cute, really. You don't, you don't do that in public. That's Kerbo. You know what I'm saying? You're around cool people. We do this all the time. All the time. What's your name? My name? Miss Rat. Hey, hey, hey. You know? And, and we do this all day. Like, it, 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 it amazes me because, like, we're forced to learn the names of other people. But, we purposefully mispronounce our name. It's not like we tell them our name and they mispronounce it, that's fine. But we give them the wrong name. You know what's crazy? What's crazy is in the prison system, what's the first thing they do? They take away your name and they give you a number. Why? By taking away your name, they take away your identity. When the slaves came to America, what's the first thing they did? Took away their name, and they gave them their name. What's crazy about what we're doing is we're taking away a, a, an aspect of our identity. You start to Americanize your name, and you start to think like an American, which is okay, but then you throw away your identity. That's the problem. And a lot of the things we talk about, our tradition and stuff like that, people are embarrassed about who they are. <coughs> Not Kali. So he sets up this uh, monument. He makes sure that the people are safe. And then he goes back to Ethiopia. I apologize. I told you this is going to happen. <coughs> I apologize. Mm. I'm going to try to get through it. If we can't, we got to cut class early today. Guys, this is really mad. <coughs> He's taking out his cross like, <laughs> what? <laughs> I, I apologize. Mm. Okay. <clears throat> so, soon afterwards, 
<coughs> Khalid thought that everything was fine. So he goes back to Ethiopia and he's thinking everything is good. But in Himar, there were a lot of people that were angered. The Jews particularly, they were angered by what was happening. Suddenly there's this new Christians and Ethiopians surrounding their nation. They're not too happy. Particularly a man by the name of Yusuf Asar Yithar. Oh, it's going to be a long day. <laughs> it's going to be a long day. <coughs> and he, was anger he was angered by the Christian leadership. So he decided, like, he's going to garner more people. He's going to get rid of all this new Ethiopian Christians that were in his land. Who? This character, Yusuf, who's a Jew. <coughs> but before killing all the Christians, the Himorites or whatever, he knew he had to destroy any threat that would come from Ethiopia. So the first thing he did was, he went to the city, and any of the Ethiopian soldiers left behind by Caleb, he killed all of them. Any church that Caleb built in Himar, the Middle East, he burned them down. In his own words, these are from the writings of his own words, he said this, <coughs> First, I was able to throw into disorder and seize all those Ethiopians who remained in our country, who were guarding that church which they had published abroad that they had built in our country. <coughs> and I killed them all, 280 men, monks and laymen. That church of theirs I converted into synagogues for us. So listening to this word, these words, you can see how he's like happy. Like he's like proud of what he did. Like, oh yeah, I killed these people. Right? <coughs> he's gloating over the, the, these horrific acts that he's done. And it's worth asking, what is it about humanity? that gets us to gloat over our wrongdoings. We as Christians, we do it all the time. When we do something wrong, instead of turning back to God and repenting, we gloat over it. <coughs> Perhaps the most clearest evidence of this is among guys and how we talk about girls. For us, whenever we hook up with girls, whenever we do a girl wrong, it's an opportunity to go to our boys and talk about it in a positive way. Even among Christian uh, brothers and sisters, we talk, hey, yeah, you, you know me, you know, I got a problem, you know what I'm saying? You know, you know, I got issues, you know, I can't it. Right? It's like we are proud of the things that we do. We gloat over going to parties and getting drunk. Yo, last week, my man, yo, you are crazy, dude. Yeah. Hey, you know what I'm saying? It's like we are gloating over, like, doing wrong. <coughs> there was a study done in 1930s by Winthrop Niles Kellogg. I'm 100% sure I mispronounced that. And this guy, what he did was, he, he wanted to see if you raise apes and humans together, if the apes will start to behave like humans. After all, apes have a lot in common with humans. That was the study, that was the hypothesis. <clears throat> it turned out that this, this Kellogg character he had a five-month-old infant, and he was like, this is like a perfect study, because I'll go get an ape, and I'll raise him along with my son. This is true, 1930s, you can look it up. And he brought him home, and he raised them together, side by side. 
had like when you bought a diaper, make a two. Right? And put a diaper for him, put a diaper for him. They eat together, they talk together, equal love, equal everything. Let's see what happens. Uh, <laughs> to Kellogg's surprise, instead of the ape behaving like a human, the baby started mimicking the ape. And when he was growing up, he was late, he couldn't like communicate effectively. <coughs> Instead, he would mimic the voices of the ape to communicate with humans. And he was like, I gotta shut this down. I gotta, I gotta, this is not, this is not a good experiment. What this shows is humans are very capable of mimicking their environment. You see? If you are around people who think it's okay to talk about girls in that fashion, you will think that way. This is why you cannot be around bad company. People say, no, you don't understand. We grew up together. I'm not telling you didn't. That's not, we're not standing up here telling you you didn't grow up with him. We're telling you bad company is not good, especially for Christians. No, 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 you don't understand. They're always there for me. They support me. I'm not saying they don't. I'm sure they do, but they think like good, well for me. I'm not saying they don't. I'm telling you, if you're around bad company, it will influence you. And my question is how much do you care? As a Christian, how much do you care? And a lot of the things, yeah, we think it doesn't influence, we think it doesn't bother, we think it does, it shows that some aspect of our lives will be influenced by the people we keep around us. In the case of Yusuf, <coughs> he was around a group of people who told him, it's okay to kill Christians. So he did. <coughs> but he didn't stop there. He knew he killed all the Ethiopians in Hemar, but he was scared that the Ethiopians might come back. And he wanted to block any possibility of Ethiopians ever entering to the Middle East. So he came up with a very bizarre plan that it would, it would be hard to believe if it wasn't written about in all history books. The only point of access between, why is it not, it's not doing it. That's fine, that's cool, that's all right. The only way between Africa and the Middle East was this body of water that existed. And Kaleb, there was a port in the Middle East named Medaban. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. And that was the only way that Kaleb or anybody else could enter. So he wanted to ensure that there would be no way to enter into that port. <coughs> So what he did is he created a series of chains in the middle of the body of water to make sure that Ethiopians had no way of entering. It's like Trump saying, I'm going to build a wall for the Mexicans, but actually doing it. Not just talking about it and being looked like he was crazy, but actually going through with it and building it and showing to the world that it worked. <coughs> so sure enough, he built, he built the, the chains. And then he blocked all access to enter the Middle East. All the Ethiopians have been killed. He had free access to the local Himerites to kill them any way that he wanted, to destroy them as much as he wanted to. The most gruesome act took place in 523 AD in a city named Najaran. <clears throat> in Najaran, he went to the city. He asked the Christians to renounce their faith. They were afraid. They were scared. So they agreed to. <coughs> Unfortunately for them, 
Yusuf had no intention to spare them. He went forward and he killed hundreds, if not thousands of Christians within that town. But he wasn't satisfied. That was a Christian nation, a Christian like city. And for hundreds of years, people were being buried in that town <coughs> who happened to be Christians. So he ordered the bodies of the previously buried Christians to be exhumed, collected the bones, took it to the church, and he burned everything down to trace away any reality of a Christian living in that town. <coughs> Much like you guys, the Christian world was distraught. When the Christian world heard what happened, they said, we must intervene. Whatever Christians are left in that region, if we don't get there, they're also going to be killed. And it started with none other than the Roman Emperor, Justin I. Now, what century are we in? What century? Sixth century. Sixth what happened in the 5th century? 5th <coughs> century. The Council of Chalcedon. What was the Council of Chalcedon about, just generally? Besides the religious aspect. Be besides the religious aspect. Thank you. There was a power struggle between the Egyptians and the Romans. Right? We talked about this. It was like the Romans were like, we are Romans. We, we are like by Peter. Right? We are, we are established by Peter. And Peter is like the rock. He said he was the rock. So we Romans have authority over all Christians. And the Egyptians were like, that doesn't sound right. And they broke away. So there was a power struggle between the Romans and the Christians that escalated to the point that there was a split within the church. It's called the Alexandrian church, which is the Egyptian, and then the Roman church. This happened in 5th century. 100 years later, the issue in Nazaran starts. Justin, who is the Roman emperor, says, we've got to go save the Himorites. But I'm a little busy. I'm a little busy, and I think the Ethiopians should do it. So let me encourage the Ethiopians to save the fellow Christians in Himar. Oh, by the way, to ensure the Ethiopians will do it, I'm going to have my message. Of course, there's no email or whatever. It was a letter back then. And he ensured the letter was delivered through the hands of the Egyptian bishop Timothy. Think about that. The Egyptians and the Romans have beef. They don't like each other. They're fighting. But now, all of a sudden, Rome wants Ethiopia to go fight in the Middle East. And instead of talking to him directly, he's going to go to the Egyptians. Hey, I know we fought, but, you know, help me out here. Go to the Ethiopians and, and try to see if they're going to fight. And Rome is like depending on Ethiopia's Yulunita. It came from bishop. Because remember, the Fremnatos, the bishop that came to Ethiopia, he, was, he came representing Egypt. He's not from Egypt, but he came representing Egypt. Egypt is now the mother church. <coughs> so although they're being encouraged to go fight, it's, it's almost like, you have to go fight. Please, please go. Go, go. But you have to go. But, you know, go. Go, please. And not only were they encouraged to fight, they're told that if they go, they'll get all the help they need. This is a Christian cause, they're told. Right? This is do it for the fellow Christians. And if you go, the Romans said, we'll send help from the Egyptian towns of Koptos, Bernaiki, Nobades, 
Nubia, and so many other places. Like all these like places will come and support you. You just have to go. And Ethiopian is like, you know what? We don't know about all this like Rome stuff, whatever, but yeah, if Christians are dying, we have to go save them. And as long as you're gonna, you got my back, right? Like, cause I can't do it by myself. This is like a, a mighty army, like they're killing all these people, like, but you got my back, the Christian world, right? Everybody, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, okay. <coughs> King Caleb, he gets his soldiers. He's like, it's a Christian cause. People are dying. We have to go save them. Let's go. And then he gets Rome. He turns to Egypt. He's like, guys, come on, let's go. Guys. Guys, where's everybody? Nothing. Rome, Egypt, surrounding places, no one came to the aid of Caleb. He spent time writing to other nations, begging them to come to support this cause. No one wanted to come and help. <coughs> Eventually, he still felt compelled to help the people who were in need. Realizing that help wasn't coming from this world, he turned to God. Out of desperation, he prayed, help in this cause. Let me be a vessel. Use me. Let me save these people. And if you read the writings, you will see the amount of spiritual, like, you know, strength he had at that moment when he was broken. Your most effective prayer will come when you're desperate. Have you ever wondered why, like, you can't get into prayer? And if you're like, you know, my prayer, I just don't feel it. It's probably because you're not desperate. It's probably because you're not desperate. True story. Back in uh, college... I, we had a Bible study program at my university, and every week I would go to Bible study. And <laughs> at our house, at our apartment, there were like this group of people that would come from time to time. I, I, I didn't like them, I just, you know, but they were there, you know, but Christianity is love, so hello. <laughs> and, you know, I'll just go to my room. But it's like every time I went to Bible study, one kid in particular, he would mock me. Ah, you're going Bible study, God, ah, ah, God, you're going God, ah, ah. He didn't talk like that, but you know, I got to make him sound like that. So it's like, he would have going, and he would always like make funny when I'm like, okay, all right, I get it. It's funny. Ha ha, Bible study. And I'll just go. It was so annoying because like every week he would do that. One particular Saturday, <clears throat> he decided to walk into Best Buy and to steal a video game. And <laughs> that's not even, <laughs> like, it's about to get a lot worse. <laughs> brace yourself. <laughs> oh, brace yourself. So on his way out, he gets caught. Now you could do it. No, I'm <laughs> so he gets caught. And he's, he catches a case. He's told he has to show up in court. He's going to get in trouble with the school. That night, he's like, I got to take out my anger. I got to just like, you know, like release my anger. I can't think about this stuff. And he decides to party it up with his friends. They get in the car. They go to a party. They drink. They drive. They drink. They drive. They drink. They drive. They hit a car. The other guy was drunk too. So they're talking, two drunk guys who just got an accident, and they're talking to blah, 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 blah. and the guy, like, you know, they didn't know what to do, so he's just like, let me get in the car, and let me just drive off. Hit and run. So he drives off, and he's running, he's looking back, he's looking back, he runs over a girl. And then he goes. You know, sin is interesting. Unless you put a stop to it, the more you keep going, the more dangerous it gets. At the first encounter, if you could just stop and turn back to God, it's easier to come out of it. But the more you keep on letting loose and just keep doing it the wrong way, the more you're going to fall. 
The next day was Sunday. He got a phone call from the police officer. And he was told, we want to talk to you. At that moment, we didn't know what happened to the girl. We didn't know anything. For me, it was a Sunday. It was time for a Bible study. Before I left, he said, you going to Bible study? I said, yeah. He said, pray for me. Pray for me. Before it was a joke, now he's desperate. When you're desperate, you have the most effective prayer. How desperate are you to be saved? How desperate are you for God? That's the difference between effective prayer and non-effective prayer. Kale was desperate. It wasn't about him. It was about these people who were suffering. He gets on his ship and he starts marching to the Middle East. He did not know that in the middle were these chains that prevented him from going forward. At that particular time, suddenly a group of Roman ships appeared. I have to be very clear here and say, this was not the intervention of Justin, but of God. There's a much research on this. There's PhD, there are people who've done their PhD on this and they have shown these ships were not warships. They weren't prepared. They weren't built for war. They were a commerce ship. They were meant for business. And the people on the ship who showed up didn't know there was a war happening. They were just coming for business. And they happened to get there at the right time. It was the intervention of God. Right when these ships came and merged with the Ethiopian ships, suddenly a huge wind started. By the way, it sounds fake when we hear this. It sounds like a fairy tale. These stories have been written about in, uh, in uh, Coptic sources, I believe, and Greek sources, <coughs> Arabic sources, Syriac sources, in all the languages. And this is why I say, like, the Westerners, if you read the scholarship, you can tell they don't want to admit it happened, but they're forced to accept it just because how many of them have talked about it in history. We don't know our own history. And what happened is when the wind started to blow, all the ships oriented in such a way that they started banging against the chain simultaneously. And that momentum of the wind banging against the chain broke the chain in half. They weren't in control. They couldn't control it. But it kept banging through. And then the Ethiopians were like, eh, nah, 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 nah. so then <coughs> they went through, they went to the Middle East, and they rescued the Hemorites from being persecuted. That is such a beautiful story. <clears throat> and I'm amazed how little we know about this, how little we have taken time to study it. But that was, by the way, because of this move and, and the presence that Khalib had in the Middle East, that kind of is the reason why it motivated part of the Quran being built. We've talked about this, I think, a few weeks ago, right? There's his presence in the Quran. We talked about this? This is why. Because they were going to the Middle East, they were saving the people, and they had dominance there. This is a hundred years before the rise of Islam. Speaking of Islam, how are we doing? Should we go? Keep going? No, stop. Yeah, <coughs> Speaking of Islam. I think it's important to talk about the inception of Islam just for a little bit because it had a huge role to play in our understanding of the world. Just like I did for uh, the history of Ethiopia, I think it's only fair I give you the traditional version and then the scholarship. I've been doing that with Ethiopian history. I want to stay uh, uh, true for Islamic tradition as well. Traditional uh, perspective is that Muhammad was born in the city of Mecca. Now, if you guys don't know Mecca, think of New York. 
What I mean by that is very busy place, interaction with very different type of people, different traditions, exchange of commerce. And whenever you hear exchange of commerce, think of religion as well, exchange of religions. So this was a city that lived on this idea of different ideas, different religions coming into this town, and that's how the city thrived. Muhammad was born in this city. <coughs> At the same time, by the way, I should mention, <clears throat> in the 6th century or 7th century, 6th and 7th centuries when he lived, there was different forms of Christianity. Different forms. So there were some, like, kind of what we would think today to be bizarre, of Christianity without the idea of Trinity. So they rejected the idea of Trinity, but they, they viewed themselves as Christians. Um, some of them thought that Trinity was God, Mary, and Jesus. Like very bizarre and weird things happening at that time. And the Middle East was, was kind of the place to go. Because if you got you know, persecuted in Rome, you run to the Middle East. It kind of worked out perfectly. So especially Mecca, it just favored, you're weird, we're weird, so come with us. You know, like, so everybody was just kind of hanging out there. So Muhammad is born, he grows up, and he has a revelation from Jibreel, St. Gabriel. <coughs> Muhammad cannot write or uh, read or write. And he's, he tells his followers, I have revelations, right? I have these kind of revelations that are coming up. They weren't given to him at once. They were given to him over a period of time. So there would be times he'd sit, I got a revelation, and he would like tell them the re what it was. And people would start to write down what he was saying in caves and in walls and anywhere they can. Does that make sense? And I don't remember what tribe he's from, but his own people were like, he keeps saying there's one religion. And like all the other religions don't really count. They were like, that's what the city is about. Like that's what we are. Like, if you tell us all the other religions don't count, what are we going to do? Like, this can't happen. So they start to persecute him. They want to kill him because that's like against the city. The city can't exist if they don't have all these type of ideas coming in and all this stuff. So then he starts, there's a nearby city named Yitrab. And they, the Yitrab is the exact opposite of Mecca. This is a place where people farm. It's very low key, chill. And they're like, why don't you come here? We, we're not going to chase you down. We want to learn. I come here. So Muhammad goes there because he's being persecuted. He begins to teach them. They're very happy. And in his honor, they renamed the city from Yitrab to Medina al-Nabi, meaning the city of the prophet. And they, like, they honor him. They respect him. And that's how Mecca and Medina started. Are you guys with me? At the same time, when Muhammad was fleeing from Mecca, the, some of the people were like, well, we just want to leave this area altogether. He was like, well, if y'all want to go, Ethiopia is a great place to go. They're very nice people there, and you should go. <coughs> Around this time is when the Ethiopians started entering, or Muslims started entering Ethiopia. And actually, if we read the Quran, there's a verse that indicates how Muslims entered Ethiopia. Surah 582 says, <clears throat> Surely you will find the closest of them an affection with believers who say we are Christians. This is because among them are priests and monks, and they're indeed not ignorant. This is about the Ethiopians. <coughs> One thing that I want to say is there appears to be a misconception about the Quran. A lot of people think the Quran like came down at once and that's how it was kind of created. The tradition tells you that, like I said, Muhammad started revealing certain things. It was written down in rocks and books and stuff. And then eventually they said, after he died, we should probably write this stuff down into a codex, like a book. And they were like, okay, so they started writing stuff down and it became a book 
unfortunately, different versions started coming up. And people were like, well, my Quran says this, my, your Quran says this. And there was that debate. And the Muslim leader, Uthman, the Islamic leader, Uthman, said, we have to standardize the text. Meaning, there's only one version from now on. And he collected all the different versions, brought them together, and he standardized the text and had all the other ones burnt. Today, the Quran version we have is called the Uthmanic version. Right? So a lot of times when we have one version, yeah, because all of them were burnt. You know? <coughs> this is important to understand. Now, this is the traditional version. Everything that I told you is the traditional of what Islam is about and the emergence of the Quran. The scholarship is a little bit different, especially after the 1970s. In the 1970s, uh, scholars, Islamic scholars started asking, what do we really know about Islam? They were like, really nothing. We, we don't really know anything. We just know what the tradition says. And there were certain people that started to push back against the narrative of what we think we know about Islam. Particularly, I took interest in this scholar named Christoph Luxemburg. And he was a linguist. He wasn't interested on the culture background or anything like that. He was simply interested in studying the Quran linguistically. As he started to read the Arabic, as you guys know the Quran is written, written in Arabic, he started to recognize a Syriac subtext, a layer underneath the Arabic. What that means is, imagine I was writing a letter to Kasabai, right? In my letter, I'm like, Dear Kasi Sabai, how are you doing? Da, 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 da. I have a deja vu about something. Uh, the other day, I was walking with my fiance, and she told me I needed a liaison. And then I'm using all these French words. It exists in English, but all these words are French, right? But every other like, sentence, if I'm using these French words, at the end of the day, he's going to ask me, Do you know French? Because why are you using all these French words? That's a fair question, right? The more French words I'm using underneath the English, you're gonna ask how much like French do you know? Have you been to France? Like, what, what is your deal? The same thing was happening in the Quran. There was Syriac subtext in that language, and the more study he did, he found a significant amount of the text was written from Syriac. Why this is critical is because the Syriac language happened to be used only by Christians. Leading scholars to ask, who was the Quran meant to be read by? <coughs> and they're asking, maybe this was meant for Christians altogether. And the Muslim or the Islam, Islam religion was not meant to be a separate religion from the Christians. Remember, there were different forms of Christianity that existed at the time. Their problem was the Trinity. They didn't like the idea of Trinity. But they were like, as long as you think there is one God and stuff like that, we're down, like we're good, like we're not enemies, right? <clears throat> it wasn't until the 8th century that there was the schism that we see today. <clears throat> and actually, if we read the Quran, I'm, I'm not suggesting we read the Quran, but if you read the Quran carefully, you will see kind of aspects of this. In Surah 29, verse 46, it says, Do not dispute with the people of the book. <coughs> Save in the fairest way. And then it says, and say, this is what instead they're supposed to say, we believe in what has been sent down to us and what has been down, sent down to you. The people of the book are, are Christians, by the way. Our God and your God are one. And to him, we are submissive. You see that? I'll read it again, especially the last part. We believe in what has been sent down to us, what has been sent down to you. Our God and your God are one, and to him, we are submissive. <clears throat> All this to say that our understanding of Islam may not be like what we think it is. Now, 
Once Muslims entered Ethiopia, they were able to trade. They had a lot of land, and we're going to talk about this another time. And, but when they entered Egypt, <coughs> something else happened. Uh, Egypt was a Christian nation, but suddenly it became a Muslim nation. They dominated the world. Muslims dominated the world. Prior to Muslims entering uh, Egypt, the relationship of Ethiopia and, uh, and Egypt was very simple, right? The Christian nation of Ethiopia made direct requests with the Christian nation of Egypt to receive bishops. You see how it worked? After Islam entered Egypt, the Christian nation of Ethiopia had to make relations with the Muslim nation of Egypt. And this relationship with, was with the sultanate, right? So their kind of interest is not in the Christians. So they were always trying to ask, what's the best thing for us? What can we do to get better? So there is a lot of money spent. Uh, some of the bishops, you will see uh, next time, how they opened up mosques. The bishops opened up mosques instead of opening up Christ, uh, churches and all this stuff. We're going we're gonna to look into it. So this, this had a major impact in that relationship. When he came to Ethiopia, <coughs> the Muslims dominated the trade. So the Christian nation of Ethiopia couldn't trade anymore, especially in Aksu, northern region of Ethiopia. So they started to go down south to where they could be more free. And that's where we have a transition of power from the Aksumites to new empire. When Aksum started closing down, the empire of Aksum started falling apart. Around the 7th century, 8th century, you see a real digression in the empire. We don't know exactly when it stopped, but we know it stopped around the turn of the first millennium. And after this, we're going to see a rise of a new group of people taking charge of Ethiopia.